Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome for uh, this session with our former artist in resident, Yelena Popov. The great pleasure of this session is to yeah. welcome back Yelena, who was artist in residence here between 2016 and 2017, which is a wonderful scheme uh, supported by gener the generosity of some of our alumni who brings to college artists from all walks of life. Carol Adam has just is concluding it on last day on the same scheme. And Yelena is a all-round artist mm -hmm. working with tapestry and painting and, and so many other things. And she will talk to us just now with scientific spiritual Gerstling's tapestry and her siblings. Yelena, over to you. Lovely to meet you all. I'm very happy to be back. And as far as I'm concerned, all the important people are here. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Francis, Peter. It's great to see you. Um, so yes, it's been, you wouldn't believe, five years. So it was five years since I spent a year at Girton, and it was the most uh, fruitful and important year for that branch of my tree, which I'll be talking about. I especially call the talk um, Tapestry and Her Siblings. So I will be talking about the work which taken shape from, from the tapestry. Uh, because I also work with painting, but I wouldn't discuss that today. So tapestry and her siblings. And you can see, I started to use that in some, um, some C, um, like biographies, that little phrase that I spent a year at Girton and started to talk to scientists and read Wikipedia. That was the groundbreaking uh, discovery for me. Um, so the tapestry called for body, mind, and spirit. And I don't think I ever gave that presentation to the college with all the reference, like not all, but with the references for, for the creation. So you can see William Morris tapestries of like muse, muses. And I thought when I was just working on the idea for the tapestry, that, that I, the figure of the muse of knowledge or this knowledge or that knowledge, but female figure would be a right thing for female college. Um, so I was looking a lot at that, and also you can see the frame, uh, the image within the quite a decorative frame, I quite like that. Um, and then of course the female figure raises the question, I was t thinking a lot about Vitruvian man being the measure of all things, and then how the woman is somehow not the measure of all things, but she could be. And also how to abstract the, the, fig the human figure, how the human figure could become an abstraction. So um, there are lots of, and here we come to spiritual. The, um, there is the six chakras, which you can see the, somebody mentioned that in, in the tapestry. So this idea of energy spots for energy points, portals for, for the human body, but also how the human body, the general proportions, and there are quite a few studies which we can look at with the kind of proportional relationships. But I picked uh, this one, and you can see four three large circles and how the, like the head becoming the measure for the body. And so there is eight, eight heads in, that, um, in, in those parameters. So that, that we appeared, arrived at that central motif which comes from the abstracted human figure. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so this, this kind of central, central um, motif which has that irradiating quality of, um, um, and the frame, the, uh, the frame within the frame, so you have that figure and you can see the connection to the William Morris figure within the frame, and the decorative frame with, with the lines. And I must confess, I spent a very long time trying to figure out what will be the ideal thickness and the, um, the rhythm for the line. So I knew that the line will repeat and will go like that, but to find that right tempo for, for this rhythm was quite difficult and until I saw the bricks. So if you can see that those lines of the bricks comes kind of, they connect. So making that little, so. I was working on the computer, and the computer you can make different thickness and it doesn't matter. But unless you work exactly with the space, and very early on I thought that that space will be ideal for the tapestry having that 
vista and you can come quite close, but then you can see it from the far. So the bricks were quite important and I've done quite a lot of brick watching <laughs> while I was in Girton. Um, so the next um, tapestry, which was kind of in, was spoken about when, um, while I was at the residency, it's the Eddington piece for the community center. And again, it was quite difficult to figure out what should it be about. So it was up to me to find the subject or the, the, the theme for the tapestry. Um, until I've read the long list of surnames of scientists, which could be like, it was for Eddington, it was the list of people who are connected to Girton and who should be celebrated. So all the scientists connected to nearby um, colleges, universities, there's a long list. And I spent a long time reading Wikipedia on each person who was on that list until I found <coughs> Hertha Ayrton, who happened to be Girtonian. And another wonderful thing about Hertha Ayrton, that she used to do wonderful drawings. So her studies were full of drawings. This is her original uh, images of the study of the electric arc. Um, and I thought, wow, those are, this is the material which I can um, use directly. And, um, and the, another beauty of those images that at that time it was all black and white, the black and white world, analog black and white world. Um, so she had to write the colors. I thought it's quite sweet that um, all the colors are um, written rather than colored in. Um, so I took the electric arc for the central, um, central motif. So this is slightly re redrawn geometrically abstracted piece which represents the electric arc, the study which she, Hertha Ayrton was most famous for. And you can see the electric scheme and the, the light. But here at the bottom, there is another piece of, um, which, piece of academic research which made Hertha Ayrton so famous. And it's to the point that it was even used by Google. There was once used um, on the Google search line, her drawing. Uh, and this is the drawings of the ripples. So she was studying the ripples and um, to discover that no ripple exists on its own. As long as there is one ripple, there is always another. And I thought that such a beautiful metaphor for the community. So, and especially for scientific community, that um, there is no, nothing disappears. So every document, every scientific research has a ripple effect and it brings other people into that um, kind of exploration. And also the um, Eddington community. I thought that people who come to study, postdocs, fellows, they all should um, stick together and have that sense of connectedness. And ripple, ripples on the sands is quite a beautiful metaphor for that. So um, that was quite a wonderful project. And um, I also liked how it kind of color-wise, it really sits well with the colors of the building. Um, so um, the next tapestry was also quite scientific, surprisingly. I, I just don't know why it was started to happen to me. But um, this one is called One Too Many. And um, the research I started to do at the residency at Wakefield. And Wakefield is this small town far north, quite deprived with a huge prison in the middle of the town with just like across the road from the art center where I stayed for a month. And um, I've learned from Wikipedia in that in this prison, um, Klaus Fuchs, the nuclear scientist who also used to be a spy, who was uh, in that prison for being a spy, uh, delivering the diagrams and um, important information to Soviet government during the Cold War. So this idea of kind of knowledge share and um, science being more generous, generous than politics and more open. Um, 
But also, so I started to look at plutonium and uranium because that's what the subject of, um, of the whole hustle. And uh, this tapestry shows the atom of uranium. Oh, I, thought, I think I have an image. So it shows an, an atom of, oh, where was it? Yes. So atom of plutonium and atom of uranium. And I discovered that the difference between those two materials is just one neutron. So that's why uh, the whole series is called one too many. Um, and I've redraw this atom of plutonium, which is quite a beautiful structure. And again, that's um, an etching made with the same, same motif. So atom of uranium becoming an atom of plutonium with just one um, neutron. Um, and I also made the performative gallery floor game. So um, the game allows infinite amount of sculptural arrangements, but it's also kind of collaborative game. So thinking about the Cold War, it's, um, it wasn't really, a it's, it's a competition. So I tried to make a game which is based on the structure of plutonium, but it's a collaborative game. So people enjoy building these structures, massive structures, and then there is this kind of hockey tugs, um, wooden things, and they have to slide them and break the kind of ruin them. And it's quite fun, it's quite fun building it together and then quite fun um, trying to knock them down. And, um, and at the gallery, especially in Wakefield, I think it opened up doors for different types of audiences. So people could come with children, toddlers, um, pensioners, everyone had to go and everyone enjoyed it. And I did offer it for um, Gerton swimming pool once but they didn't want plutonium in their swimming pool for um, some, um, some reasons. But uh, we also took it to, um, to the swimming pool and had an event with children and synchronized swimming team. And the, um, how do you call these people? The um, swimming, swimming instructor was instructed, there was a, um, a friend of my performance actor. He was telling the story of the development of plutonium and the whole kind of um, Cold War competition around the production of the nuclear um, arms. But um, in the same time, he was giving directions how to swim with a synchronized swimming team. So it was quite a mix, mix, mixed event and I think everyone enjoyed that. So the next project uh, is called the School of Stone Project and it was commissioned by the University Gallery in, Ma in Manchester. Uh, Manchester University has quite a large um, gallery and um, they do have wonderful exhibitions there. And for that, um, again, I followed my nuclear interest and uh, traveled around, around United Kingdom. You can recognize the map. Um, and um, visited the places of the locations of the first nuclear first nuclear reactors, nuclear reactors of the first generation. And um, you can see those um, red spots, that's where I've been, and the black spots where I haven't um, managed to visit. But um, for me, it was a journey to kind of study the landscape, study geography, geology, and also understand how those um, cooling, decommissioned monsters, or this nuclear kind of heritage, how does it sit in the landscape and what happens? And I was collecting stones. So all the stones I picked up from different location, they have this school of stone <coughs> collection and the display. So I made the display structure which um, presents this kind of nuclear graphite, graphite core. So the, because I discovered that what happens with, um, with those decommissioned plants, the graphite core, this kind of, big like mother worm where plutonium was made stills, uh, still stays at the locations and that's what's so difficult to move. So they can move out all the plutonium and metal bits but that kind of big uh, graphite worm, uh, womb, womb it, it stays there. And that's this kind of the stone for the stone for contemplation, that's this big massive rock which we have to think about and what happens to it. And um, so um, I took that motif, the graphite um, 
for the tapestries. Um, so you can see half, um, half of that uh, graphite core and the kind of propositional mausoleum um, above. So I was looking a lot at different types of architectural mausoleums and um, Lenin mausoleum in, 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 um, in Moscow is one of them, this kind of really recognizable ziggurat structure for kind of body which can't be buried and that idea of the body which is, you know, is not buried, is kind of still there. So, and I also looked how, how it's presented usually in architectural drawings. So you have a um, elevation and the plan. And sometimes it's even if the plan is symmetrical, you just have half, half of the plan. And uh, that's, that's what I kind of try to do in the tapestries. This bottom bit is the <coughs> graphite core and mausoleums is above. And um, this motif is quite interesting. I lifted it off from uh, Neolithic um, stone carving. So there is this famous uh, Neolithic stones with water represented in this kind of spiral, spiral movements. And I thought usually those um, decommissioned reactors, they are they based around the water because that's where the locations are. So the ocean is quite close or the, you know, the water is quite close to them. Uh, the next one was the spinning wheels of industry. And this is something quite straightforward and it was done for a Nottingham University um, Conference Center. And I was looking a lot at uh, industrial production of lace, which N Nottingham is very famous. And there is a beautiful museum in Nottingham with all the lace machines and all the cogs and wheels and bobby nets, um, they're quite inspiring. So I, th I thought just kind of repeating the diagonal movement of the staircase. And again, that was quite lucky because I didn't know the, 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 riff, the size for, for this wooden element um, which they introduced later. But it, luckily it kind of coincided the rhythm, uh, which I think really makes that image alive. Uh, you're probably all familiar with this piece, but I thought I should mention that because it's part of that family. Um, and I specifically repeated that central motif so it connects to the tapestry. Um, but in this case, I worked with, um, with the archive, not Gerton archive, and uh, we looked at all different data. So um, when Gerton just started, this the amount of fellows, these white lines, they show the amount of fellows. And the red, the red dots, it's the, uh, the staff, the member of staff. So all that in the period of 30 years, I think, 30 years, um, how the community grows. And so the, the print represents that growing community and it's true to the numbers of what the archival um, uh, work did. And um, I believe there are still pieces left. The puzzle is really difficult, really enjoyable. <laughs> I hope you all agree. So um, there are puzzles and um, prints. Uh, the next tapestry is also, there's two tapestries and they're very scientific. I think this is the most heavily science, uh, um, scientific, Subject. So it was commissioned by Eurofusion project and uh, they were interested in putting up a, a, a big show about Eurofusion for the public to understand and to um, kind of know the history. So um, I was looking at a lot of, I had in my, in my documents, in my, in my files, I had three folders, occult, solar and uh, technical. So, I, of course, I looked at all the technical data for what's the nuclear fusion um, is and how it works and what they're going to build. But um, I was also looking a lot of occult images because it still feels quite a magical thing. It's, it's just magic to make that amount of energy uh, with so little resources. Um, and I also looked at um, solar, a lot of 
kind of s solar studies, what, what the sun, how it works. Uh, and I, I will show you just a few images here. Um, I think that th those are from the occult folder. Um, you might know that. I already forgotten, but it was really interesting read that the uh, there is a, some divine mathematics going on with a circle uh, and the triangle, um, which might have explain or somehow describe mathematical properties of the torus donut. I'm not quite sure, I, I can't quite remember. But also interestingly, the same symbol was used by Masonic Lodge. So yes, I was absolutely fascinated by that. Um, that sim and also the Holy Grail, that idea of kind of resurrection and energy. And I had a lot of images of that. Uh, this is the technical images of the, of the what they're trying to build, this kind of fusion reactor. Um, um, that's quite good, the plasma goes in. And I also looked, I quite like this idea of, um, that's the first Takamak, um, which was designed in Soviet Union in 50s. And for me, it was quite interesting to find out that the technology for fusion was already there all these years. And they say that if the same amount of finances and um, energy were put into development of that technology, um, we would have had it 50 years ago. The problem is that all that energy and resources were put into development of the nuclear bombs, uh, hydrogen bombs. So that idea of kind of impossibility, uh, which the kind of this impossible object, I quite liked, and historical connection of um, it's kind of almost there, but never is there. And they say it's, it's nuclear fusion is always 50 years ahead of us. So 50 years ago, it was almost reachable. And at this point, it's almost reachable, but we don't know yet. And I thought you might enjoy looking at the, like how the ideas developed. If you ever, I'm sure all of you done lots of writing. So the writing, usually you put some ideas and then they have to merge together. So this, this is the technical drawing of the fusion. I had to draw it to understand, so the fusion reactor. This um, diagram of the energy, how the energy is circulated and the kind of energy generator. My father helped me to draw that because he used to teach electrification. So that electricity bit. And you can see how, you know, the, this, the size, the position, all these elements, they kind of shift around. And I had this image of the sun. So the sun is solar. So I was trying to draw the sun and that element of the impossible torus. Um, and then later I come up with this idea of the Promethean chalice. So the chalice is um, the holy grail. So the holy grail become Promethean chalice. So this image of the holy grail and then that bit becomes this bit. So um, it's kind of, it's all there, but um, maybe in a different shape. And um, also that bit uh, is the hydrogen, I think hydrogen reactor, how the, um, yeah, so the, that's, that's the reaction which happens in the sun, which produces energy. So that's, that's, that's that bit. Um, so um, another one, so another tapestry with a bomb has a lot of imagery about solar, solar discoveries and solar development. So we have a Kepler's law. That's when um, Kepler proved that the um, orbit of the Earth around the sun is not circular, it's oval. So that's how I understood that bit. That bit, it's the first drawing proving that it's not the sun rotating around the earth, it's the earth rotates around the sun, and it was done by Aristarchus. So it's really key moment in the uh, kind of cosmology, then we understood that we're not the center of the universe. And then of course, spectrum analysis and the um, um, telescope, like the lenses of the telescope. And you can see all that at the, at the tapestry. And of course, there is this image of the bomb, because all that, and the tapestry name is Cosmologist to H-Bomb. So um, 
that's what uh, cosmology done at that time. They developed all this information, all this knowledge, and it become hydrogen bomb. Um, so it's like a dark history of f uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, so we come to the uh, Girton fireplace, and you probably all know this famous textbook by uh, Christine McKee, which I relied very heavily in design, in this design, um, which has wonderful illustrations, but also is quite um, important. I looked at the Helen McGaw's um, archive and her advoc advocacy of the um, Festival of Britain. So there is a lot of wonderful textile designs which come out of that, of her work. And I thought that um, that's useful. Uh, and again, so we have these crystalline structures and the lenses. So I was quite interested in drawing, drawing those lenses, the devices, the tools which allow us to see those um, things. This is something I've done quite recently in 2021. And this is um, probably the major commission. And you can see how in four, like in four years, the complexity of the language, it's almost like I've, I've learned to speak something um, quite complex compared to the Gerson tapestry where it was just one, two elements kind of put together. So there's a lot of elements and I spent many, many hours trying to kind of interweave, interweave that and the story of that, um, of this design, of course, you can see the mother tree. I've read a lot of um, books on the forest and uh, the mother tree. There is a recent book which was published, and the secret life of trees, how um, this um, network of fungi and um, bacteria under, under earth connects trees and almost functions as their brain and how this mother tree supports the sibling, uh, the younger trees through that kind of connections. But um, it's also about, the tapestry is made for Facebook, so the evil Facebook um, for their office. So of course I couldn't not mention the network in the more traditional sense, the network of human connection and kind of energy distribution and motherboard. So there is a lot of kind of inspiration come from the motherboards and kind of diagrams which connect, um, like in terms of the part, even pattern development. Um, and this is, was quite, quite, you know, so I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but the, this is the wallpaper and it's behind this tapestry. So I designed the wallpaper, but then it's covered by the tapestry. So I'm not sure <laughs> why I spend all this time, but um, I still think it might be important one day that maybe tapestry will travel somewhere or at least it's not a bare wall. Um, and somehow it's nice to see those two images um, with kind of alive and curvy things and without those curvy things. Um, and this is my last commission it's just happened, it hasn't been even revealed. And um, this is the stage curtain for the community center in Whitehaven. So it's about 18 meters by four. Um, absolutely massive piece and I was really, it was really important for me to make. Um, and again, you can just, from, from one tapestry to the stage curtain, it's quite a journey. And um, yeah, it's, um, let me see that. Um, and there's quite, um, quite a lot going on here as well. So as a central uh, motif, I took that Cumbrian landscape. So it's always a mountain and they use it a lot in uh, even Whitehaven's um, coat of arms, uh, this idea of the mountains and the sea, the water. So we have the mountains and we have the sea. And I was also trying to maybe compose it as this expanded pattern or like a musical musical element so which could be performed potentially in the future 
It's not happening yet, but so you can see that the, the, the divide is there and something, the pattern kind of evolves and um, like I was, I was mostly interested in that bit, but um, we also included the mining tokens which represent the local industries. So people, um, there is big on my, uh, mining, there's nuclear industry, there is um, acid making, there's chemical factory, salt making, rope making. So, there's, um, so every industry, all, all kind of heritage sites, um, they all represent it. And, uh, but this is um, something which I had in mind originally. So for me, you probably know the tapestry. It's a really famous tapestry in Victorian Albert Museum. I'm not sure if it's on show now, but this idea of the tiny little wonderful animal, innocent in the vast landscape of nature. So, um, and I try to kind of introduce the contemporary reading so this tiny little white cat in this industrial landscape, and also Cumbria is kind of pitching itself as an energy production, energy coast of Britain. So there is a lot of energy production. And again, this kind of a nod to my parents, to, to my dad with kind of electrical diagrams um, and all the things. And this, this is the quiet, the first commercial nuclear reactor in the area, which is just 10 minutes drive from Whitehaven. Um, however, the community didn't really want to associate just the nuclear, um, so that's why we introduced all the, all, all other bits. Um, but that's, that's what I thought in the beginning. And uh, from that sketch, um, oh yeah, the cat, I should tell you about, why it's not a unicorn, the cat. So <laughs> there is a, um, first of all, there is a myth in Cumbria, and I don't know if you travel to Lake District, um, they do say that the, the, these black, big black cats of Lake District of Cumbria, Cumbria they exist. Um, and there are some photographs online, so there's like these panthers or, um, there's also Mooncaster Castle, has a logo of this big cat, so there is a historical present of the big black cat in the area. And there is a mummy of the cat, or it's called desiccated cat from Keswick Museum in the area. And of course the cat is such a wonderful creature which everyone can connect to and it's a stage curtain for the community center. So I thought the cat is just right, plus all the, but I also thought about this. This is um, very important. The ray cat is the solution proposed by scientists to, um, to let people know about nuclear waste. And as I said, the, um, so, like, the, the whole area is probably gonna be geological nuclear waste depository there anyway. Um, there is this uh, wind scale. Um, so you, you can't not mention that. And, um, so I'm doing my bit, I'm introducing the ray cat idea into culture and um, I hope it will work. So this is this innocent ray cat playing in the nuclear landscape, contemporary nuclear, post-nuclear landscape. Um, and the blankets are available and it's only 28 of them. So let me know if you're looking for special present. Um, and that's, that's me done, and we could still make to Lady Hale's talk. Thank you very much, Elena. Fantastic. There is a moment for questions still, if there is anybody wanting to ask something. Yes, anywhere. yes. Yes, Carl. Yes. But, um, and obviously, you seem to have um, had an opportunity to see a wonderful yeah. photo to read it in front of the British Institute. Uh, um, and how do they get made as well? Is that, do they, uh, oh, the tapestries, yes, they designed yeah. on the computer, long hours, yeah. so bag. 
painful eyes, you know, all the pain. Uh, but the result is so wonderful. The paintings made in the studio, beautiful experience, on my feet all day, enjoyable, no pain at all, different uh, kettle of fish. Um, so yes, it's two different processes. Enormous paintings are probably more recreational, I would say. Um, but this is something which usually commissioned, there is a budget, and I can't stress enough how much the budget, which was part of the residency, allowed me to do that. Because if there wouldn't be that chunk of money which I could go to the, to, to the weavers to find the company, to spend that money, um, I wouldn't be able to do it ever. But now, and because I also produced two tapestries, so there was addition of two, so the second one was sold to invest in my next tapestry. So it really launched that um, trail of work. Uh, and that was really lucky for, for me to be able to do that. It is a costly process and it's not something you can just um, get on and do it. And that's why my Gerton experience was so crucial into developing the whole line of um, textile work. Thanks. Well, the, uh, the last one, the stage curtain, it's a different weaver because it's, it's a different fabric and it's a different width of the loom. So yes, I discovered the second one, and, um, and, but they're all in Flanders region. So all the machines, all the knowledge, all the textile, they're all there. Mm. No, 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 I just, it's near, yeah, um, it, it is like, I, I, I couldn't, all my life, I couldn't bear the idea of sketchbooks, I just, like, when students show sometimes this, grubby, like dirty sketchbooks, which is like all crumbed. And you just think, what is this? I don't want to look at this. And uh, this idea of doodling or something, I doodle sometimes, but I don't even consider that as a work. So um, I think there is a certain clarity on the computer when you, you know, you're moving elements and the elements are precise. So that kind of, but in the same time, I work with my hand and the paintings, as you know, they're very calligraphic, so it's a very steady, steady hand. But I just don't want these small, crumbed papers with loose. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, not at all. Do you think it's asymmetric? It's precise. But you can see that structure. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do one back. Yeah, one back. Let's have a look. That one. Yeah. Yes, yes. The expanded pattern. But then in the same time, you can see that a large uh, room, that room. Everything sits in the front. And then the kind of things happen, but they still balance with the red balance there, that balance there. But it's still very. I think, and that's, that's the criticism. I was talking about it with my um, friend who is also a big mural. And he said that that image is different because this is completely random. Everything is random. Uh, in that image, it's, you know, you can still see this central, central line and everything is quite well organized. So, um, but yeah, quite a, Quite a development. I'm quite keen to develop that. Um. I think it's huge for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and I hope to have that expanded pattern. I was trying to kind of maybe find a new research stream with this uh, concept of expanded pattern. Maybe take some knitting. Oh, that's right. I was I was looking at sankwa pattern. Do you know sankwa knitting patterns? and try to design something with that particular 
So there are patterns, but then how do you kind of blow it? How do you? Um, yes, yes, thank you, Peter. Thank you. It's just great to discuss it with you. Lady Hales? Thank you very much, Yelena. It's been a great pleasure to have you back and hear from you. And I was in the previous session with Paolo, and I can't think of two more different <laughs> artists in residence, and that's the greatness of this team. And I'm so glad that the new work that you started on Gertrude has brought you yeah. lots of new things. Yes. And all my best wishes for what there is in the future as well. Thank you so, so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant.